it was spring to I guess it's in Colorado next Denver next year I think yes. maybe oh, um, I think so. looking forward to that yeah Let's see yeah we're ready to Okay. Oh, want you to do it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry. I missed okay. it. Good morning from Lakeside Chautauqua, and welcome to our third day of Faith for Living with the Reverend Dr. Shively T.J. Smith, Assistant Professor of New Testament at Boston University School of Theology in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Smith is with us this week, and it's been a rich week so far as she's given us images from Howard Thurman to think about, and then the biblical image, and then what it means for today. And I can hardly wait for the third image coming up uh, in a few moments. I wanna share with you that Dr. Smith received her PhD at Emory University. She's been preaching since she was 16 years old and is an ordained elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church where she just completed a series of Bible studies with their uh, conference recently. And her book, um, the, the book Strangers to, uh, to Friends is available, excuse me, Strangers to Family is available to order through the fine print bookstore here at Lakeside or online. And she'll be sharing with us again tomorrow. Dr. Smith's presentation is being supported this week by the Reverend Dr. Bud Cox Endowment, and we thank Sue Cox and her family for their generosity in establishing this endowment in memory of uh, Dr. Bud Cox and the wonderful people that were able to bring to Lakeside, either virtually or live in his memory. I would also share with you that this afternoon is the second of our seminars on Lexio Divina with Nancy Flinchbaugh who is a Christian contemplative and author. De Lexio Divina means divine reading. And we are reading the scriptures in the beautiful setting of the train station patio with the trees and the, the flowers and the, the breeze. And it's a wonderful setting. And if you've not had a chance to be part of that, I encourage you this afternoon from three to 4.30 at the train station, if you are in Lakeside. And I would also remind you if you're not in Lakeside, that Dr. Smith's presentations are being archived. And so you can see them uh, at, at, later, at a later time. Uh, you can go back and review the ones from Monday and Tuesday. You can hear her dynamic sermon from this past Sunday. And you can also provide a link and share these with your friends so they can hear as well. And we're getting considerable response from uh, not only from Lakeside, but across the nation and around the world which is very exciting. We were very disappointed when the season started that we weren't gonna be able to do everything live and in person, which is kind of what Lakeside is all about. But we've reinvented ourselves and now we'll be able to share in a much greater way. And folks who are not able to be here this summer are still able to participate and they are grateful and we are grateful. Would also remind you of a couple more things and then we, will, we need to get started. Uh, first of all, this evening's picnic is at Perry Park at six o'clock. And I would ask you, I mean, at 5.30, 530 p.m., I'd ask you to make a reservation by going on the Lakeside website for that. It's very easy to do. You just give your name and the number of people and it's $6 per plate. And then tomorrow evening, we continue our Thursday evening Vesper series with the Reverend Karen Graham, who is the pastor of the Lakeside United Methodist Church. And she has a summer series going on the fruits of the spirit. And there will be another fruit explained, another uh, aspect of the spirit tomorrow evening, again, at the lovely setting of the Steel Memorial Bandstand with Holy Communion to follow. Well, it's time to delve into Howard Thurman and our image for the day. And I would welcome you back to Lakeside, Dr. Smith. And I eagerly look forward to what you have for us this morning. Dr. Smith, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's again wonderful to be here with you on this third day, this Faith for Living Hour. I'm delighted and have enjoyed and I'm continuing uh, to enjoy this journey with you. Give me one moment to share my screen. All right. 
So for those who are returning, you are probably old hat to this spiel. And for any newcomers, let me explain to you what we're doing. This out during this um, devotional hour, this is an opportunity for us to use our faith for living hour to center ourselves in the words of Howard Thurman by paying attention to the images Thurman uses to capture our imaginations, to encourage us, to inspire us, to think about the the, the dynamic way in which we relate to God, relate to neighbor, relate to each other. And then we're looking at how those images that Thurman proposes as opportunities to ponder what it means to relate to God, neighbor, and self. We're looking at how those images appear across the biblical text as well, that many of the images that Thurman uses, in fact, are biblical images. They are images of our Christian faith that are present. They are items and uh, um, and, and they are um, references, but they are also even in the biblical text there to inspire us, encourage us, help us to expand our understanding of who God is, what God's spirit is doing in the world, and what we should be doing as we what join up together with God and God's spirit to do the work of loving mightily courageously, without ceasing, boldly and radically. We are talking about a radical relatedness that changes us, changes our communities and changes our society. And Thurman invites us into that work through the contemplative pondering moment. So with that being said, I wanna invite you now to find a space if you haven't found one already that can be your centering space these next minute, few minutes as we are together. Perhaps you are one who centers by journaling. So you need a piece of paper or a journal near you to center as you contemplate and think and ponder about this dynamic relatedness through images. Perhaps you are one who likes to doodle, paint, draw. What, what suits you in pondering and contemplating is a canvas that you can paint on. I invite you to use this time um, to, to grab that canvas that you need so that you can doodle, so that you can paint, so that you can draw. Perhaps you are someone in which you hear God and contem contemplate best near the things of nature. Uh, wherever you are, whatever, uh, what, whatever space that you need to be in or whatever props you need to center, I invite you to center down as Thurman as Thurman says, to center down is to sit quietly and to see oneself pass by. Let us sit quietly and see ourselves pass by in community virtually. The meditation that I want to uh, frame this time around is again from Howard Thurman's book, Meditations of the Heart. Uh, and this particular meditation is called, I Will Sing a New Song. For those who are new to this, uh, who, are, who are joining us for the first time and you may not be familiar with Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman was a dynamic, dynamic historical figure in um, the US. He was known as a mystical theologian. He was, has been known and called the pastor or sage of the civil rights movement. He was teacher and mentor to Martin Luther King and others in the civil rights movement. Indeed, it's even said that Martin Luther King would uh, carry around one of Thurman's books called Jesus and the Disinherited because it inspired and um, anchored his, his um, faith-based moral understanding of or what it means to be related to, to each other and to be citizens and to care about each other's circumstances in life. Um, Thurman was, um, has met much to his credit. One of the things that's to his credit that I love is that he uh, became the first African-American dean, um, university dean um, in um, the US of predominantly historically predominantly white institution, Boston University. So, um, uh, there's much that can be said about the ways in which Thurman lived his life in a prophetic and fulfilling way. If you don't know him, I invite you to get to know him 
um, in a real way. There's a documentary called Backs Against the Wall that um, introduces him in a very profound way. And so I, again, invite you to get to know him. One of the things that Thurman did was um, leave us books of meditation for us to contemplate uh, and to sit with him in the centering moment. The one I want to use is called, I will sing a new song. I will sing a new song. Center with me, my sisters, my brothers, my siblings in this moment and in this reading. The old song of my spirit has wearied itself out. It has long ago been learned by heart so that now it repeats itself over and over, bringing no added joy to my days or lift to my spirit. It is a good song, measured to a rhythm to which I am bound by ties of habit and timidity of mind. The words belong to old experiences, which once, which once sprang fresh as water from a mountain crevice fed by melting snows. But my life has passed beyond to other levels where the old song is meaningless. I demand of the old song that it meet the need of present urgencies. Also, I know that the work of the old song, perfect in its place, is not for the new demand. I will sing a new song. As difficult as it is, I must learn the new song that is capable of meeting the new need. I must fashion new words, born of all the new growth of my life, my mind and my spirit. I must prepare for new melodies that have never been mine before, that all that, all that is within me may lift my voice unto God. How I love the old familiarity of the wearied melody. How I shrink from the harsh discords of the new untried harmonies. Teach me, my God, that I might learn with the abandonment and enthusiasm of Jesus, the fresh new accent, the untried melody, to meet the need of the untried tomorrow. Thus, I may rejoice with each new day and delight my spirit in each fresh unfolding. I will sing this day a new song unto thee, O God. I pray that this time together will allow us to sing new songs together while we're in person and virtually. This is my prayer for our morning meditation. Amen. I will sing this day a new song. The image that I want to invite you to contemplate with me and to sit with for a little bit is the image of music, this language of sing a new song. Thurman uses music, uses the exhortation to sing a new song, to invite us to a new way of thinking about our relatedness to God, our relatedness to neighbor and the world and the and, and things of our daily, of our what he would say our daily rounds, the things that we do from day to day. He uses music and a new song to think about what we can do and what we can produce and be in the world. Music, singing a new song becomes Thurman's invitation to us to think about what it means to relate mightily and courageously and dynamically to our God, to the spirit, to uh, neighbors, to ourselves, to the world. I want us to think about, to listen to, to hear the music that is in our faith and that is in our hearts and that is around us in the world and be encouraged as Thurman has encouraged us. Sing a new song, music. So you, you're, if you're, this is your third day, you're used to this screen. <laughs> so this is the time where you get to sort of have a moment of pause. So what do you visualize? When you ponder Thurman's image of music, 
of quote unquote singing a new song? What do you visualize? When you ponder Thurman's image of music, of singing a new song, What does the music sound like? What does the music look like that you visualize? What do you hear when you hear music as an access point, as a doorway to thinking about what it means to relate to God and God's spirit, to neighbor, to self? What music rings in your soul, rings in your mind? What music do you wish you could grab, you could gravitate to or grab for instead of listening to me talk about music? You want to hear music. What music do you hear? Where does the music come from? Whose songs do you hear? You naturally hear. Whose songs do you not hear? Who, whose music do you actually think is not music at all? And yet for them, their music brings them life and hope and animates them. What music is readily available to you, familiar to you? What music sounds strange? You question if it is music. Where does your music come from? Who makes it? How does it, how is it made? What instruments are involved? What technology? What instruments are missing? What voices do you not hear? Who gets to sing your song with you? And who doesn't? Why? Why do they not get to sing with you? Who are they? Where are they? What music do you hear? What music is silent to you? So as I have done, I wanna encourage us to continue this reflection just a little bit longer. Um, by giving you some images to help the reflection process. Perhaps the, if you, perhaps the image that comes to mind when you think of music and you think of sounds and you think of singing a new song is the image of the ocean, the sound of the ocean. Perhaps the music that you think about, that you hear is the music of our faith communities. Those faithful hymnal songs that you remember from your child childhood or that your grandparents would sing. Some of my favorite memories are remembering the music my grandfather and grandmother would make in their rural country church in Kentucky. I would watch them sing with much joy and faith and resilience and hope for their families, hope for their communities, hope for this world when they would sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, when they would sing In the Garden or I Come to the Garden Alone. I remember those hymnal songs of Be Thou My Vision. The spiritual songs I find that encourage me now that, continue, that, get, that give me the hope that I need to continue to live the music that they make, such as how great thou art. Great is thy faithfulness. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Perhaps the music that you hear, that you find yourself wanting to sing as a new song, 
is music from our faith communities. It is the music that has formed some of us. It is the music that is with us even now. Perhaps you think of our spiritual songs. Perhaps instead of music itself, you think of the hardware, the things that we use to project our voices and amplify sound. You don't want you, for you, music is not just about being heard, it's about being heard well and clearly, right? It's about the amplification of the sound that fills the whole earth with the music and songs of God. Perhaps you think about music and sounds of sort of that obsolete musical technology, which I actually really do love. Um, you know, the vinyl records uh, that we used to play as, um, as uh, children, as adults, right? You remember what it, looked, what it was like to put that record on the record player, right? And what it sounded like for that record or, what, or when it went bad such as you ended up getting a scratch on it. <laughs> you remember the difficulties of sometimes getting that music out into the world. Perhaps you think about the technology by which we're, we, we make and share music. Perhaps when you think about music and sounds, you think about the music you listen to during, during your daily or morning walks and your jogs, the, the music that you listen to when you are trying to find that meditative and contemplative space. The music that inspires you to listen just a little bit closer to yourself, to the spirit, to God that is in you, that is around you. The music that helps you to think differently about situations, the music that invites you to imagine something or to consider something or to perceive the world in new frames. Perhaps you think about the music that's, uh, that's streaming through your AirPods. <laughs> Or perhaps you're thinking about the music that nature makes. You imagine the sounds of a singing birds. Imagine the, the music and the sounds of the natural musical world around us, or perhaps you imagine the music that's around you uh, that's made by some of your favorite artists in the world. So here are some of my favorite artists that I love, and from orchestra to Wynton Marcellus to Joni Mitchell to Stevie Wonder to others. Um, the music that brings you joy and hope in life. Perhaps instead of an orchestra, you imagine the music that's made, say, at a Mardi Gras parade, right? And the street bands that make up that space and all of the noise and all of the sounds um, that are around you, all of the colors, it all works together, right? That what you see, what you hear, what you feel, the people that you touch all around you. For you, music is not just music. It also has to do with all these other ways in which we relate to each other and sense the world. Everything about you is activated when you think about music. Or perhaps you think about music that is played when you think about attending, um, you know, an Alvin Ailey dancer's performance. It's not just the dancers, it's the music. The beauty of the art of dance is accompanied by the beauty and the artistry of the music that, 
that goes along with it, that takes us to new places, that reminds us of past histories and future possibilities. It is to, to see the creative genius of, of human minds and human bodies at play and at work with each other. For you to think about music is to think about the ways in which we make music with our bodies, even in relationship to each other. So I wanna use this to reflect again. So a little bit different, but still the reflecting moment. What do you visualize when you ponder Thurman's image of music? is all around us, music is in us. Music, according to Thurman, is a way of talking about the dynamic relatedness we are to have to God, to neighbor, and to each other, and to this creative world. And guess what? Music, sing a new song, is, uh, is scattered all over the biblical text in ways that we may be used to noticing, in ways that we may um, that we may overlook. So again, I have to do my job and talk a little bit about music in the Bible? Where do we encounter music in, the, um, in, um, in these texts? Yesterday, with the attention to uh, the images, the image, Thurman's image of eyes, a vision of sight, one of the points I made was that eyes or sight are ascribed as anthropological characteristics to God um, by the biblical writers in order to articulate um, characteristics of God and actions that humans can relate to, that we can try to understand and put in God talk, how God moves, behaves, what God is doing in the world, how God interacts with God's people and so forth and so on. Um, one of the other ways that biblical writings amplify uh, amplify the action and describing God is to juxtapose God's capacities and characteristics of seeing to um, the capacities uh, uh, of idols, right? Idols, the inability for idols to see. This is very much related to um, what the biblical, I would think of something like Deuteronomy 2040, in which you have this prohibition against images uh, being used or in places, particularly in places, um, in different places in the worship life because of the fear of idols um, within the Old Testament, the Hebrew text. So this sort of constant juxtaposing of God to these idols is not just really about vision or seeing, it really is about dealing with this prohibition against um, uh, images. Where am I going with this and how does this relate to music? Uh, so while Israel may not have as an expansive visual art history like say the Greeks, one of the things that we see from, um, from the biblical text is the richness of music in Israelite history and in the biblical text. Music played a central part in the total life of Israel. It appears Israel excelled, as one scholar says, in music, perhaps more than any of their contemporaries, and nowhere more so than in their corporate worship. So on one level, what we, what, what we have this sort of um, um, prohibition against sort of the image, the sight, the imagery of God, right? Because that can be um, that that can be taken as idols. On the flip side, in the biblical text, when it comes to music, music is everywhere as a testament to God, as a reflection of God, as a call for humanity and the world to look to God. Music is a major characteristic of the faith tradition, of the faith tradition and traditions we see in the biblical text and it is everywhere. 
speaking of everywhere, the hills are alive with the sound of music when you read the biblical text. So when you think about the imagery and presence of music in the Bible, I cannot say it enough. It is everywhere. Um, when we think about it, music is present in the hellos and the goodbyes of the biblical text in farewells and in the welcomes. In places such as what I have here, Genesis 31, 27, we see an exchange between Laban and Jacob. Uh, Laban confronts Jesus, confronts Jacob about his quick exit, acknowledging that music would have been a part of the would-be goodbye ritual. Why did you flee secretly and deceive me and not tell me? I would have sent you away with mirth and songs, with tambourine and with lyre. Music was a part of the commemorative ritual life of marrying and burying people. It is also invoked as a metaphor describing how people grieved and describing how people celebrated. Look here in Job 30, 31. My lyre is turned to mourning and my pipe to the voice of those who weep. Music also accompanies the war scenarios of biblical text and is referenced as metaphor to describing militaristic tactics and responses by people and by God. Look here in Isaiah 30, 32. And every stroke of the staff of punishment that the Lord lays upon him will be to the sound of timbrels and leers battling with brandished arm, he will fight with him. Biblical figures, people and communities sang and played instruments. They made music from the greatest, from the greatest or the most battle-worn figures to those whose names we will never know. Music abounds from page to pace, page, chapter to chapter, verse to verse, book to book across our biblical canon. 1 Samuel 16, 18, as an example says, one of the young men answered, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a warrior, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. We see someone with character, with character, someone named for their faithfulness, someone named as a warrior, someone named who is a musician. Music is everywhere. The heels of the Bible are alive with the sound of music. Can you hear its song? Music is also um, used for romantic songs in the biblical text, um, such as what we find in the Song of Songs and its eight chapters, love poems, which Jewish and Christian traditions agree that the Song of Songs mirrors the love relationship between God and people, even as it talks about romantic love between human actors. Song 5-1, I come to my garden, my sister, my, my bride, I gather my myrrh with my spice. I eat my honeycomb with my honey. I drink my wine with my milk. Eat, friends, drink and be drunk with love. This is not just a poem, it's a, it's, it's a song. It's a love song, right? So that in fact, even, even when we talk about the beauties of love, right? Love between God and God's creation, love between human to human, um, it, that intimate personal passion love, that the biblical text, that is also filled with music. As we saw in music with romantic love, music was a part of the entertainment and working lives of the community. They're not just, we are not just dealing with love songs or war songs or uh, uh, mourning or songs of mourning. We're also dealing with working songs and songs of leisure. Isaiah 22, 13 says, but instead there was joy and festivity 
killing oxen and slaughtering sheep, eating meat and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. <laughs> there though, is what we see is this sort of way in which music is a part of the everyday practices of the community, that there is music even as they are going about their day-to-day -day, um, um, jobs and functions, and that music is a part of their entertainment life, um, even as they anticipate the potential dangers awaiting them the next day. As one scholarly source puts it, major events in the life of the people, such as the exodus from Egypt, conquering the Canaanites, recapturing the ark, dedicating the temple, crowning the king, and returning from exile were celebrated in music and in song. Music was a central part of not just daily life of our bib bib biblical figures and their words, but music was central was a central part to their worship life, especially temple worship. It is at the heart of temple worship, indeed, that we find music there central. Indeed, it's on display as David brings the ark to Jerusalem before the temple is even built. In 2 Samuel 6, verse 5, David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals, we hear music, we hear performances, we see instruments, we see songs in just this one verse. All of this uh, is, uh, is working and interacting together as a part of the worship experience of celebrating God's presence in the community. Music in temple worship occurred at great scale, both in the forms of music provided from voices to stringed instruments to horns and percussions to extraordinary numbers of personnel and participants. Music in worship is no spectator sport in the biblical text. It is participatory in nature. It calls everyone in the room to, de to declare their collective and corporate faith and in God and action as believers, as a community of the faithful believe, uh, as a community of faithful believers celebrating and worshiping God, walking and living into a daily faithful life. All personnel, everyone is called together to make music, make song together and celebrating God. The um, Ezra 3.10, let me read that out loud to you. Ezra 3.10.11, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asphath with cymbals according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For God is good. For God's steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord, all the people, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Great scale. When we talk about music and worship, according to the biblical, te biblical text, it takes all of our energies and all of our bodies to even try to give God the praise and the word and, and, and the acknowledgement uh, that God is really due. That the Spirit of God is among us demands demands our activity and participation, not just our observation. You see this sort of collective uh, worship life, music and sound and song is a part of the collective worship life continuing in the New Testament, but it's not just in the temple. We see this actually permeating other aspects of the world that you wouldn't necessarily expect to hear worship, um, powerful and faithful and bold worship songs and praise being um, praise um, taking place. One of the places where you see this, for instance, is, is in Acts 16. So Acts 16, you get Paul and Silas in prison, worshiping God in music and song to the point that it catches the attention of the people that are around them, even in this space that we would not think about sometimes as a place of worship, right? About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. 
and the prisoners were listening to them. What does it mean to take the opportunity to think about worship music and worship songs or in the places that are most unattended by some of us? We don't think about it. We don't expect God to be there. And yet the biblical text says, even there, that is where God is and God's people are there as well. What do you visualize? Who do you see? What music do you hear? When you think about the power, power of, our, of our music, of our faithful song, God is musical. That's yet another claim of the biblical text. God is musical. God is the source of the skills and artistry and creative genius that produces music and song. As one scholar says it, when it comes to God and music, music assumes the quality of a gifted of a gift and inspiration. This is akin to what many believers are accustomed to likening as the inspired word or inspired scriptures. Look at Exodus 31, three. And I, I have filled him with divine spirit, with ability, intelligence, and knowledge in every kind of craft. Moreover, I have appointed with him a Aholibab, son of Asamak, of the tribe of Dan. And I have given skill to all the skillful so that they may all, so that they may make all that I have commanded you. God is a composer of lyrics, of melody, of rhythm. David claims as much in Psalm 43 when he says, God put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. God is a performer of music. As we see in Zephaniah 317, the Lord your God is in your midst a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. God does not just make music, God performs music. God is not just a lawgiver. God is not just a savior, a provider, our source, our protector. God, according to the biblical text, is also a musical composer and performer. Deuteronomy 31, 9. Now, therefore, write this song and teach it to the Israelites. Put it in their mouths in order, in order that this song may be a witness for me against the Israelites. God is a musical performer. God is musical. The last thing I want to say about the biblical text is here we have Thurman saying, I will sing a new song. And I don't know about you, but I have never been able to read uh, this Thurman meditation without thinking some about Psalm 96. So I thought it would be good to end this little portion with the, uh, um, this portion review of the biblical text use of music music by looking at Psalm 96. Psalm 96 says, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless God's name, tell of God's salvation from day to day. De declare God's glory among the nations, God's marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. God is to be revered above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before God. Strength and beauty are in God's sanctuary. Psalm, Psalm 96, this sing to the Lord a new song is known as a, can, it's sometimes called an enthronement song. It's a song celebrating the sovereignty of God. It names God as savior. It names God as deliverer. It names God as the one who, who is the God of all the world's diverse peoples and not just one people. It names God as the shaper and creator of all the earth and all that is created. It names God as a just judge. This psalm, which is interesting in 
interesting it's that it's actually quoted in first chronicles 16 chapter 16 verses 23 and following in its entirety and in fact this psalm if you read psalm 96 seems to have echoes to other psalms that we have from psalm 98 to psalm 29 to psalm 33 it, and then it seems to have echoes to prophetic writings such as isaiah so if you read isaiah chapters 40 through 55 it feels like you have echoes echoes of Isaiah's claims about God in those chapters occurring here in short form in Psalm 96. Some scholars have called Psalm 96 an anthological psalm, liking, um, saying that it is akin to the parent or could be known as the parent of hymnology. This is the template or parent to our musical and literary genres that we call as a faith community, our hymns. And right here in the first six verses, we sort of get a sort of schematic, a sort of template of how we kind of experience our hymns when we read it. So uh, let me give this to you. Here in the first six verses, we see three parts of a typical hymn that seem to be playing out here. Verses one through three seems to be a summons to pray. Verses four through five seem to give us the reason why we should praise. So verses one through three is a summons to praise. Verses four through five seems to, seem to provide the reason for our praise. And verse six seems to be the closing call to keep praising, to continue to praise, to undergo a renewed praising life in music and in song. So let me read again Howard Thurman's uh, I Will Sing a New Song and invite you to ponder, what do you visualize when you ponder Thurman's image of music, of song, his claim to sing a new song? What do you visualize now? Hear these words again from Thurman. I will sing a new song. The old song of my spirit has wearied itself. It has long ago been learned by heart so that now it repeats itself over and over, bringing no added joy to my days or lift to my spirit. It is a good song measured to a rhythm to which I am bound by ties of habit and timidity of mind. The words belong to old experiences which once sprang fresh as water from a mountain crevice fed by melting snows. But my life has passed beyond to other levels where the old song is meaningless. I demand of the old song that it meet the need of my present urgencies. Also, I know that the work of the old song, perfect in its place, is not for the new demand. I will sing a new song. As difficult as it is, I must learn the new song that is capable of meeting the new need. I must fashion new words, born of all the new growth of my life, my mind and my spirit. I must prepare for new melodies that have never been mine before that all that is within me may lift my voice unto God. How I love the old familiarity of the wearied melody. How I shrink from the harsh discords of the new untried harmonies. Teach me my God that I might learn with the abandonment and enthusiasm of Jesus, the fresh new accent the untried melody, to meet the need of the untried morrow. Thus, I may rejoice with each new day and delight my spirit in each fresh unfolding. I will sing this day a new song unto thee, O God. I will sing with faith, with hope, with joy, with peace in community, I, we shall sing a new song this day. This is my blessing for you today.
May you sing a new song and may others join you in that musical play. Amen. Amen as well. And thank you. Thank you so much for that, those words of inspiration as we move forward today in faith. Um, it occurred to me that um, we're in a time when, you know, this Thurman's words are eerily relevant um, with the COVID virus. They're saying that um, we're not supposed to sing or we keep, you know, we keep a mask over our face, which is all uh, appropriate uh, medically. But um, in, in the larger spiritual sense, that song, how, I can't, how can I help but sing? Or I just, how can I keep from singing, I guess is the exact word of it. And, um, and, and certainly singing is such a part of our faith and it, the core of who we are. And I think he, he brings that up beautifully and, and wonderfully. And I think that you just kind of explode with images in your mind. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, do you, have, do you have a comment about that in terms of the relevance for right now, uh, Dr. Smith? So I do. I mean, I think there's two ways to talk about this um, for me. On one level is to recognize that um, Thurman is always talking about the inner life and the inner life of the individual and the inner life of the community. And so music and song becomes a way of him trying to articulate for us um, the depth and the robustness of our inner life, right? And so that on one mm -hmm. level, no, we may be, in, we, when we're in crowds or we may not be able to come together um, in our choirs and our communities in that same way. But that's why I grab for those hymns. Like some of mm -hmm. us have, have been formed by those or in ways in which the song may not come out of my mouth, but it is in my head yeah, and it yeah. is in my heart and it is in my hands. Yeah. I think that's the other piece that I would go, that second move to the yeah. biblical text to recognize that the biblical text sees God as musical and the music in the world is not just the music that's made with the mouth or with instruments, but it is in fact in the things that we do in the things that we do to acknowledge God and the things that we do to take care of our neighbors and the things that we do in the mundane that the Monday, the everydayness of what we do can have, can ring with the music of faith, can ring with the music of hope, can ring with the music of peace. And so that I, I, one of the things I'm hoping that this, med, this meditative moment does is invite you to think about all the other ways in which we are making music, in which we should be making mm. music and singing to the Lord in what we do. Thank you. That's yeah, and I, I'm also impressed by the, the juxtaposition of thinking about songs and hymns that we know that bring us comfort, and the, but the new song of uh, you know reaching ahead and saying where do we go from here and all that. And I think it's it's a nice balance because I think the you know thinking back propels us into the future. I know there's been times when I look back at my calendar and I think. How did I ever get through that day that I had so many things going on, but I did. And that, that gives me courage for the next day that I can, that I can do that again yeah, I <laughs> or, mean, or keep on going. Um, I love that. I mean, I think that for me, that actually plays very, um, very, um, very well into um, an African notion of Sankofa, this sort of fetching what is behind in order to to move, mm -hmm. to move forward into our future so that there are the songs, like I said, of my grandmother and my grandfather singing hymns that uh, I will, that, that form me and shape me and encourage me and give me peace now that come with me into this day. And these are days that I know they could not have imagined, right? In right. a real way of, of both the good and the difficult, right? And so and so, I cannot live the life that they lived, but I can take that, that encouragement to now live the life that God is calling me to live and, and, and the things that I'm supposed to be doing. So I think that there's, again, this dynamism to our faith that um, using the metaphor of music and sound invites us to sort of ponder, to contemplate, to embody in real way, life-giving ways. Thank you. I want to invite the folks who are participating by Zoom call, by uh, on the Facebook Facebook Live, and on our uh, Lakeside website to type in questions that uh, Dr. Smith will respond to. And if we don't have time to do it today, uh, tomorrow morning for sure, uh, please continue to do that. I don't see anything coming in right at the moment, uh, but uh, if, you know, please 
do not hesitate during the day. If you have thoughts that you want to share, we're most open to sharing those with the group. And this is a, a as, as best we can, it's a group experience, uh, even, even though the two of us are the only faces <laughs> that you see. And uh, I, I, I just reflecting again on the idea of the new song and what new things do we need to be doing as we move into the future uh, in, in a new day. Uh, we don't know what the new normal is going to be in terms of our health uh, and, um, you know, restrictions. Uh, we certainly hope that the new normal in terms of uh, racial strife, which right now is, is in the forefront, that we, a better day is, is coming and we have to work toward that. And I think we need a number of new songs. Yeah, but like you say, at the same time, the spirituals, the, the hymns of the faith, uh, for me, um, the, the music of Johann Sebastian Bach yeah. um, inspires me in a way that no other music does. And I know that he wrote that, you know, centuries ago, but at the same time, uh, extremely inspirational for today. Yeah, so. You, I'll, I, will, I will love to say two things related to that. One, one, one I do have great hopes for what it, what um, post, what this post pandemic and post sort of a social distancing world can look like. And one of those hopes is the ways in which we will no longer be able to take for granted what it means for us to convene as communities mm -hmm. together. Yes. But, I mean, I think that you recognize now what a real gift it is to be in person with people um, and to share space with people. And so one of the opportunities, one of the new songs that I hope uh, that we will carry with us is to recognize the gift of being in person and together and what is required of us to care for each other in space. For again, for those we know, but also for the stranger, right? I mean, particularly for those we don't know. Um, what does it mean to make space for those who have, who, are, who have typically not been at the center of our conversations, not at the center of our concerns, but to center them now more because we value what it means to be together because we recognize how easily and how quickly and how susceptible we are to all of a sudden now we don't get to see each other. We mm. don't get to give each other a hug. We don't get to uh, look at each other's body language in person, real life, right? That we no longer get the luxury of ignoring even the body language of people. What does it mean to look and recognize that something is said and you have a colleague or you have a church member, you have a friend who tenses up, right? And that that body language tells you that something just happened mm -hmm. that made them uncomfortable and you refuse to ignore that from now on. You actually get courage to mm -hmm. create space so that they can feel safe too because you know what it means to not be able to convene at all. I mean, I think... Mm -hmm. My, for me, the new song is thinking about how do we, after this, how do we convene in ways that offer real care and concern and community to everyone? Yeah, that's beautifully said. And, and I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think that's a great, a great vision statement for the coming day and uh, to not, not take for granted what we've had in the past. I think that's that's very powerful. I know when I was at Boston University, you know, they hammered into us about the, the idea of community that we weren't in in by ourselves, and it wasn't just Jesus and me. It's the community of faith and what that means. And like you say, they that was hammered into us at Boston University School of Theology, and it comes home. Hey, I said we're still doing that. Good, one. good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I was hoping and uh, assuming that, but. Um, it, it, it drives it home now when we can't take for granted that, that we're, the community is just one of the aspects of life, but, but it's, it's something very special and um, very precious that we suddenly, we quickly realize when we don't have it. So, um, yes. well, I want to go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, yes, I really, I, I, I am encouraged. I mean, people talk about what, what is there to be hopeful for? I am, I have great hope that uh, uh, that there will be new sounds of community and relationality that 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 are produced from this that are long lasting that will impact the world for my daughters and my granddaughters and my great grand grand grandchildren and so forth and so mm -hmm. on 
Well, thank you. How much we need to hear that message of hope and that word of hope. And I thank you, uh, Dr. Smith, for being with us. We're here today at Lakeside Chautauqua with Dr. Shively T.J. Smith, Assistant Professor of New Testament at Boston University School of Theology, and her wonderful meditation on I Will Sing a New Song, the words of Howard Thurman with her own interpretation and her own uh, contribution to the ongoing dialogue. Dr. Smith, thank you. And we look forward to being back with you tomorrow morning at nine o'clock here at Lakeside. God bless you and God bless all of you. Go in peace. Bye now. Thanks.